So I heard Wes Montgomery and I thought, wow, you can actually play guitar like that. So that's what kind of led me to, I guess, basically where I am today. That's Danny Embry. I'm Jamie Green. And this is Trading Fours. Everybody, welcome back to another edition of Trading Fours, and I'm really excited about this one because I've wanted this interview to happen for a long time. I've got the great jazz guitarist here in town, Danny Embry, as my guest today. You ever have somebody that just had a real demonstrable effect on your life that just made your life better? Something that uh, was very tangible that you could take, you know, on into the future? Well, Danny Embry is one of those people for me. About 10 years ago, my kids were getting old enough that uh, I could start picking up the guitar again. They didn't need you know, me hands-on with them all the time. They'd gotten pretty uh, independent. And one of the things I really wanted to do was delve back into the guitar. And I thought long and hard, well, how do I do it? How do I become a better player? And I was always kind of intrigued by jazz guitar, but had never really uh, done it. I learned how to play guitar by ear. I, do, uh, I did not read charts. Um, I listened to things and then picked it up that way, and I thought, you know, I really want the ability to do that, be able to read a chart, look at a jazz chart, and be able to play. And you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Being a better, uh, being a better musician is just good anyway. Uh, and it really made me have a, a connection to my late father, who was a jazz trumpeter, who could uh, not only read charts but could write charts. So I looked around and I uh, found out that Danny Embry lived really close to me at the time, just up the road about a mile. Uh, and I was super nervous, man, because he's really good. Uh, he had me come in. He had me kind of audition. Uh, but I passed the grade somehow. Uh, and for the next several years, I don't know how long, two, three, something like that, uh, once a week on Fridays, I would go in uh, and have lessons with Danny. And he not only made me a lot better player, but I really cherish those times with Danny because he, as you're going to hear here in a second, he's such a nice guy. He's just a cool guy, man. Great player, cool guy. So, uh, really enjoyed this one a lot. Please go see Danny when he's out playing. Uh, he's a treasure, not only for Kansas City, but for the entire Jets community around the world. So let's get started. Here's my conversation with Danny Embry. Well, thanks so much for doing this. And, you know, I ask everybody this, Danny, until COVID is over, how are you holding up? Uh, you know, I, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm missing gigs, of course. First time in my life that I've been through this, uh, and I've been doing this 50 plus years. Uh, so it's been an adjustment, of course, mm -hmm. like it has been for everyone. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, practicing every day a few hours you know and it's hard to get inspired to do that sometimes I've got to make myself do it uh you know 
playing through some tunes, learning some new ones, reviewing some old ones that I haven't played in a while, uh, you know, starting out with that. And then I'll do some exercises and some, you know, run through some patterns and things like that, technical stuff. So I, I'm probably practicing about maybe, you know, three hours a day, breaking it up a little bit. Uh, but it's tough because, you know, it's got nothing to do with, you know, uh, the intensity of a live performance. It's hard to replicate that when you're sitting in your office practicing. Um, there's no right. interaction, no interaction, <clears throat> uh, which is a huge part of, well, it's everything about jazz music. Well, all kinds of music, actually. Uh, and, you know, you, if you play with backing tracks, there's obviously no interaction. So that stuff I miss. <clears throat> I'll do a, uh, excuse me. I will. I probably got COVID. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll do a gig, a, a live stream, kind of a safe gig, like maybe, you know, once a month or something and, and get a little taste of interacting with someone. Usually it's a duo or something like that. So, uh, you know, uh, so that's pretty much what's happening with me. Uh, you know, I'm trying to, you know, exercise and stay fairly active. It's it's you know, well, you know how it is. Just, it's a rough time. Um, and, uh, anyway, that's it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I saw you and Stan, uh, up last week on Facebook and right. uh, did he share the tip with you? I, I told him 10 for you, Stan and 10 for Danny. Did you get your money yet? I did. Hey, thank you. That was from you. Yeah, I did. I got it. Yeah, I want to he, make sure. I, I, yeah, I know he's an upstanding guy. I thought he. Oh, would. thank you, thank you. I, I didn't know who that was from. Uh, you just told me we we had that. So, uh, actually, it was pretty profitable. Uh, you know, those things actually work out pretty well. You know, uh, well, that's good. You so, know, it's yeah. it's so funny. I, I actually would like to talk to you a little bit. So let's talk about the entire jazz ecosystem right now in Kansas City. Um, because obviously you're one of those people who can talk about the history and all that stuff. So it, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is just from an outsider's perspective. Um, in the last, I don't know, what do you think? 10, 15 years, there seems to be, and I don't, I don't know if renaissance is the right phrase, but there seems to at least be more of an appreciation for jazz in a live format where people were coming out, whether it's, you know, uh, Green Lady or Black Dolphin, or a bunch of places, right? So it kind of was like Kansas City was a little bit on a roll. I mean, you could gig pretty much as much as you wanted, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I pretty much, yeah. Uh, it it has been a bit of a resurgence, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and there's, you know, the thing is, most people are. Uh, just don't know what it's all about, really. I think they're trying to understand what we're playing and try to be respectful of it. Not all of them are. Right. You know, they're bar situations, most of them, and they're, of course, hanging out, and, you know, it's totally understandable. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, I think part of it is Kansas City is known for, one of the things it's known for is the jazz music. So, People go, well, let's go out and check out this jazz band, you know, whatever that is, you know, and we'll go listen to them and have a couple of beers. And, you know, uh, so, uh, well, that's a good start, you know, um, and some people, I, I think I found that there are converts that happen through this. And if you, you know, the thing is, I think if you talk to the people, which if I have, if I'm a leader on a gig, which I am on occasion, mm. mostly I'm a, what we call a side man where, you know, there's somebody else doing the talking. Uh, I like to talk to the people and try to explain the song and, you know, who the composer is and a little bit of something about it. So I can kind of engage with the people and that helps them kind of get with it. Right. So, uh, so that has been pretty good. Well, it was until Right. We like, crashed head on into the pandemic, you know. Uh, so and, and these are young people that don't know much about, you know, what we're doing. Um, yeah. You know, one of my theories is, Danny, yeah. that they came from listening to people like me where 
they could talk all they want and we're so loud. Oh, <laughs> we're, yeah, not, yeah. we're not going to know <laughs> that sure, you're talking. Yeah, and then you yeah. come to a jazz format. It's a very different format, right? I mean, I, I obviously, yeah. uh, my dad was a jazz guy. You know that. Um, oh, yeah. I've heard him. He's very good. Yeah. He got me some music. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, you're right. I think that it is almost like an etiquette. You know, you have to edify these people a little bit about how it is and how it works and it's its own language and that kind of stuff. So um, you're from here, correct? You were born and raised here. That's right. Yes. So let's talk a little bit when you were growing up. I mean, how many of the guys, the Jay McShans and all those, how many of those guys were still around? When I was growing up, um, oh gosh, it was like, you know, mill table and uh, Betty Miller and, uh, yeah, Jay McShann, all those guys who were doing all that stuff. I wasn't getting out and hearing much of that stuff because I was too young to go to bars right. and so forth. Uh, uh, Pete I was somebody I looked up to, the Pete I trio. Some of these names you may not even know. I don't know Pete I, so tell me about it. Yeah, Pete I was a huge guy in Kansas City. He worked right every night of the week. Uh, a piano trio. He, he, had, he was a great piano player. And... Uh, and so Pete, I was doing it. Uh, John Elliott, who is a great piano. So these are all people that I was aware of and uh, I could rarely hear them uh, because I was too young. But my thing was, you know, I came up like probably like you did, you know, with blues and some yeah. you know, rock and roll kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, and then that, you know, uh, I because of my older brother, I gravitated to James Brown R and B stuff that I really took to. I loved that stuff. He had all those records. And so I'd pantomime around the house with a broomstick, you know, like I was playing the bass lines, boom, 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 you know, and the real wristy guitar rhythm. That's the stuff I really got into. Okay. Which, which was in my, other brother, I had two brothers. He was more into Jimi Hendrix and rock and roll, and all, which I wasn't all that into. So through R and B music, I got into uh, jazz stuff. That just was kind of a stepping stone because um, my brother, uh, older brother, ten years older than I, uh, had some West Montgomery records. Jimmy Smith, because he was getting into playing organ. So I heard West Montgomery, and I thought wow, you can actually play guitar like that. So yeah, that's what kind of led me to, I guess, basically where I am today. Not that I sound like Wes at all, but I like to think that maybe uh, I have some influence there from him. Uh, so anyway, that was, that was the deal. I, uh, you know, I, like I say, I wasn't able to go out and hear all these greats that you just spoke of. You know, I was just too young. I just heard about them and I heard some of them on local uh, radio and records. So when you were ready to start going out and playing jazz, what was this the 1970s? When would this have been? Well, I wasn't playing much jazz then. Uh, a week out of high school, 1970. That's right. Uh, I joined a variety band. Uh, uh, my friend, uh, uh, kind of recruited me to join this band, go on the road. My parents were like, Whoa, what? You know, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can do it for the summer. You know, uh, there was a manager of the band and it was pretty well organized and, uh, safe, you know, so, right. to speak. Uh, so we were basically a Midwest, uh, what you'd call a territory kind of a band. We had, an agency that booked us uh, in these clubs. Uh, there are basically, uh, you know, bars, of course. Uh, I was really too young to be in them, but they didn't enforce that that much back then. Right. And I, I had to try to look older. I put some glasses on and just tried to look older or something. Um, and uh, every Ramada Inn, Holiday Inn, they all had lounges. Back right. And there was bands in all of those places six nights a week, okay, uh, because they had to do that to compete with the other ones. So, and there were separate clubs, and so that's what I did. I, I backed a singer, 
I backed singers my entire life. So, uh, you know, some good, some not so good, but that's <laughs> what I did. And, uh, and I did that for three years and I didn't play very well then. I wasn't really qualified to do this touring with this band, but it was my good friend that got me in there. And, and so, but I learned really quickly and, uh, you know, we, I, I did it for like three years. We, you know, occasionally we'd have a week or two off and I'd come back home and visit the folks. And, but that's, that's really how I learned how to play. Well, I don't, th I was just going to say, I don't think, uh, and I think this is interesting to me. Um, you can't replicate playing live, right? You have to actually do it. You're not going to get better playing live and being a better guitarist or whatever you play uh, until you actually go out and do it, which I think, that's right. <laughs> I'm going to sound like an old fart here, but uh, the younger generation, I think they're too much into, oh, I'll play with, you know, a YouTube track and I'll get, I'll stay in my house for whatever. And yeah. I'll, I'll record myself, which is fine. And you should, that's okay. But I, I think that like you were talking about that interaction that we're all missing right now Yeah. and it, coordinating all of this and not only hearing yourself, but having to listen to your bandmates and all like, that's a really it's a really important uh, a way to evolve as a player, correct? That's correct, yeah. Interaction, because you're obviously reacting to what you're hearing around you, the players. So that's the whole, that's the whole thing. And it really doesn't matter what kind of music you're doing, really. Um, uh, but especially in jazz, is because it, it can take a turn somewhere. And so you can't, you're right, you cannot replicate that at home. Uh, right. with tracks or anything like that uh you can keep your skills up is what i'm trying to do right uh as best you can but uh, uh yeah the other thing is just and you know i try to encourage my students and some of them are just scared to death to do it is to go out to jam sessions which now of course there's not many but before this thing hit there were quite a few places that you could go out and jam and you'd be welcomed to come and, and play a couple of tunes with a live band and just get your feet wet. They were so scared of, you know, failing or hitting wrong. Well, I did that. I failed a lot, you know, yeah. uh, but I learned from it. And then the more I did it, the better I got at it. But I was pretty fearless when I was young, you know, uh, yeah. So now, now I'm more scared than I used to. Uh, uh, so that's funny. Anyway. So let's, uh, uh, so when did like Karen Allison, when did all that happen for you? Uh, let's see, that would have, I started working with her at a place called the Phoenix, 8th and Central, okay, downtown. You may be familiar with that place. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. still there. They still have live music. Yeah, yeah, uh, tiny little squeeze stage, you know, it was set up as a as a uh, piano bar kind of a thing, you know. So uh, she came to town from, uh, at that point, she came to town from, I think she was, she grew up in, Oma, in Omaha, and then she, and then she was living in Minneapolis for a while, and then she came to town that because her uncle owned the place. Okay. And her uncle offered her a gig. <clears throat> so... I would play with her just as a duo now and then Rod Fleeman would do the same thing too. And, uh, she liked guitar players cause we, we, we could play some chords with her and then solo. So she liked that. Uh, and I started doing that and then, uh, you know, uh, we were, and then she started growing uh, as a, as an artist and started to put together larger groups, quartets or whatever, and would play at the, uh, place that was going on back. It was the Plaza Three in the basement. They used to have a lot of jazz there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, probably six nights a week. It was a lot going on. That was a popular place. I don't know if you'd remember that, but uh, yeah, you know, it, I, I'm not for music, but when it yeah. was around, it's been like, a yeah. while. It was the basement, and it was a really nice place. So she started working there, and then she had an opportunity to uh, do some recording. So I helped her with with a, a record and uh, played on that. Rod and I played on it, Bob Bowman. Uh, and uh, that came out well and Concord heard her and offered her a contract. And then we started touring around and I started going out with her uh, doing that. So I did that for, oh God, I was probably working with her 
including the Phoenix and the touring probably 15 years. So, yeah. uh, and you know, I've gotten pretty good at working with singers and I ended up doing a lot of arranging and producing for singers, mostly local singer CDs. So anyway, that's, that's how that happened. And then I just got tired of the road and traveling and I, I had it. I, I just had to give it up because it'll wear you out. Yeah. And she's been in New York now for how long? Oh gosh. She's been in New York for probably, oh gosh, probably 12 years, I would guess. Yeah. 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 Not much going on there now, unfortunately. Wow. And all the, the great jazz clubs are closing up. Birdland is, is in trouble, which is one of the greatest. Uh, Blue Note, I guess they're still going, but Jazz Standard closed. Uh, uh, Smalls is not doing anything. There's a lot of the clubs there. It's really sad. Uh, I mean, a lot of obviously great players there that really have no place to play. No, it's a, this is a national emergency everywhere. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's happening everywhere. I know, you know, you probably... Uh, we were playing at the Jacobson once a month uh, and it was actually had built a crowd and it was going well. And, you know, the Jacobson's gone forever. Um, I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's just one place. And there's, this is all over the country that, you know, it's, it's sad. Uh, and I don't know what the future holds for a lot of these places. I'm concerned. Um, and I, it's been interesting to see how the clubs, I know they're trying to do live streams. I know, uh, Right. Actually, the zoo. Did you ever play the zoo bar in Lincoln ever, Danny? Oh, yeah, I did years ago. Yeah, kind so the funky place and, you know, bathrooms right next to the stage. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. You have to <laughs> like you have to swing your head underneath the bass yeah. player to go to the restroom. That's right. uh, so they're actually doing a Patreon thing where for eight bucks a month, you know, they're tr that's how they're trying to stay open. So I yeah. joined that because, you know, um, so it, it, it's tough. And I, I don't know. I'm hoping that the vaccine takes off and that we can get back out. But, you know, these are places that, well, like Birdland and the history of these places, you know, if they shut their doors forever, that's never, even if they try to reopen, it's not going to be the same. And we've lost some really great places. So, I, no, I, know. I, it, I you know, I'm, I'm afraid nothing will be as it was. We'll have to just adapt to whatever it becomes yeah it's a real shame yeah because yeah. Well, like you say they they close and 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 they're not going to reopen a lot of them no yeah. uh, so let's back up a little bit so i obviously know this but uh, i imagine a lot of people when we're talking to younger people to come out and see you don't know that you were sergio mendez were you his musical director what did you do exactly for no sergio? no i wasn't he asked me to do that at one time but i was a little shy about doing that so i i didn't I did not do that, but I, you know, I joined him and um, uh, I guess I started that group in 1980. I did it for, eh, I guess, seven years. I was, I left LA in 87. Uh, I got there in 78. So I was there a long time, but I was with him for, yeah, seven years, maybe six. I can't remember, uh, but it was wonderful. It was a, a group that, uh, I kind of had a, when I was in high school, uh, I would see them on television once in a while. And I had a fantasy of playing in that group because it was jazzier and it had that Latin feel. And he had a guitar player, a couple of guitar players. And I just loved the music when I was in high school. Uh, and, and I thought, wow, that'd be cool to play in a group like that, you know? And, it ended up coming to pass, you know, so it was pretty cool. Absolutely. Uh, I was totally thrilled. Uh, somebody I met out in LA that was a great guitar player. He's actually the guy that wrote Maniac. If you remember. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael Simbello. He recommended me because he heard me doing a disco gig out in LA when I first moved there. Disco was still barely hanging on. Right. You know, we're talking Donna Summer tunes and you know, boogie, oogie, oogie, all this stuff, you know, yeah, it was time. a really good, yeah, it was a really good disco band. And I had a gig plan with them four nights a week. Anyway, he came out, Michael Timbello, and uh, he heard me and he liked my playing. And so Sergio would call him and say, I need a guitar player. And so he recommended me. So I didn't have to audition. I just went to a rehearsal and Sergio said, okay, yeah, let's go. You know, so my first gig was a seven week tour in Europe which I'd never been out of the country before. Right. Uh, except I stepped across the 
the border to Mexico once. But <laughs> Juarez. Yeah, that's that's some great cultural uh, yeah. exchange, right? You yeah. go to a bar in Juarez. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was totally thrilled. So you know, uh, you know, here's this kid from the Midwest, and I've got seven weeks in in in, in Europe. Anyway, anyway, so that's how that started. I did that for a long, long time. And, uh, so let's, you know, I, I'm hoping, so one of the ideas of this podcast is that I'm trying to like people who are not musicians to kind of give them some, you know, how things work. And yeah. so, so I'm old enough. I remember Sergio being on like the Mike Douglas show. Right. Oh yeah. So he actually had crossover hits, right? I mean, he was on the pop chart some too. So, and for people, where was he from? Was he Brazilian? What was, I know he was South American, right? Where was he uh, from? Brazilian. Yeah, yeah, sure. He's from uh, near Rio across the bay in a town called, uh, let's see, what's it called? Uh, starts with an, anyway, yeah, basically a real guy. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, he, mostly he was on the pop charts. Right. Uh, but he started out loving jazz music. His his favorite guy was Horace Silver. OK. Uh, but then he got into this L.A. thing where he wanted to be a, a producer of pop music, you know, kind of like Quincy Jones. And he kind of uh, forsook if that's the right word, jazz music, like, ah, that's, you know, that's nowhere. So and then he, he concentrated on, on, on being a, a pop guy, although right. he had jazz overtones in his music. Yeah. Yeah. And you went all over the world with them, right? Saudi all Arabia. Over, Where'd you go? Tell me like a quick list. Oh, you know, all over Europe, several times, Australia, Japan, uh, Israel, Jordan, uh, man, you name it. Uh, we were there. I mean, just pretty much everywhere. Australia, three weeks. I remember that. Uh, it, you know, a lot of places, South America, Central America. Anyway, just pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Is anything that just stick out? One of those trips, like kind of a pinch me moment? Uh, no, I would say the pinch me moment was the first uh, seven week tour that I just mentioned of Europe. To be able to go to Italy, Spain, France you know, all those places. Right. Uh, that I just, I was just thrilled. Like you know, my eyes were like, Whoa, this is, you know, uh, so anyway, that's, those are the places. And then I kind of got used to all this traveling in these, uh, you know, unfamiliar places. I kind of got used to it, but the, the first trip uh, to Europe was the thing that really knocked me out. I thought this is, this is like a dream come true. It's unbelievable. I'm playing all this great music and I get to see the world. Yeah. So, yeah, it was great. And then I became kind of <laughs> later, it was kind of, you know, what's, what's the word? But anyway. Uh, and you did the White House. Oh, we did the White House. Yeah, I played in the East Room. So let's yeah. talk about that. I don't, you're going to be the only musician I've ever had on, you're, you know, you're episode 52. You're the first one, hopefully. Yeah. Probably the only one I'm going to get that said, hey, I played in the White House. So, I, you know, this Reagan was president, correct? Reagan. Yeah, I got the picture right up on my wall. That's how uh, I know. When you come for lessons, your head is right. That, so you probably never see it. <laughs> but yeah, played for Reagan. Uh, reason we were there is Reagan was welcoming uh, the president of Brazil. Okay. And so whoever does puts this stuff together, they say, well, let's have a Brazilian band. Right. And, uh, Sergio. So, of course. So uh, we did that. And uh, uh, let's see. It, it, was, it was quite fun. We played, I think. 20 minutes or something. All those things are really short. Uh, Debbie Reynolds was in the audience and she was pretty drunk, I think, because she was like heckling uh, Reagan when he was talking. Great. Yeah, she, wanted him, <laughs> she wanted him to sing something. She said, sing something, Ronnie. You know, and he would chuckle, you know. Anyway, it was kind of funny. Oh, well, Debbie. Oh, well. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Thank you. And, and we were packing up at the end and then this other guy with the suit on comes... Uh, kind of hurrying up to the stage, jumping on the stage and says, Oh, hi, I'm George Bush. Right. That was the dad. The VP and, then. The yeah, VP then. Yeah. Uh, and we thought, ah, vice president. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Who's this clown? Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. That, that's fun. But it, it was, it was, a, it was fun. And uh, my mother certainly enjoyed it. And, oh, uh, I bet. That's got to be a proud moment for a parent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you just oh, my something. son's playing at the White House. Yeah, yeah you know she told everybody, <laughs> right? 
that's, that's right. Yeah, that's funny. So I, I I always think it's good. I know the world's it's a heavy time in the world right now. So let's have some fun. Um, am I the worst student you've ever had? <laughs> Absolutely not. I think you've done really well. You're you know, you you seem to pick up stuff really fast, and you come from the same place that most guitar players come from, including myself, which is rock and blues and that kind of thing. You know, our, our fingers aren't used to playing some of this stuff. You no. Know, fingers are not accustomed on the guitar, you know? Right. Well, there's, uh, there's a couple things that foot with that. First of all, I think it's confusing on guitar. Like, you know, you know, I played piano first. And if yeah. I'm reading music on piano, there's only one place on the piano keyboard that I can play that note. That's, That's it. Right. A middle, a middle C is a middle C. Yeah. Right. But right. on a guitar, you can play the same note at least, what, three places? Three or four uh, places, yeah. Right. Um, so that's yeah. confusing. And I think, you you know, uh, to your other point, so I learn by ear. So I, for did, you, too. I did too, yeah. So, so it's almost like you have to go backwards um, and stuff. But no, I really enjoyed it. You made me a, a lot better player. And, you know, one of the things I really appreciated about you, uh, besides the fact you're very kind and friendly and stuff, is like, man, we were there to work, right? Like, we, I sat down. Uh, and we're going, we're going to just do it. And uh, it helped me a lot. And then I've actually now I've done some things with uh, Kelly's, my wife's cousin, Laura, where she sent me a chart and I had to play along and, and without your teaching, I couldn't have done that. So oh, thank you. Thank uh, you. That's, that, that's rewarding for me to hear that, that I can help. I mean, I, I enjoy helping my students out, giving them knowledge. And some people are more, you know, tight with what they know they don't want to give out too much because it's you know you this is my stuff you figure out your own stuff but i'm i'm happy to give it out you know uh and just kind of you know show you the path to kind of get there so i think but you're a good player i've heard you play live and uh you're a good musician that's for sure well thank you it's, it's just a different vocabulary is what jazz people do it's a totally different language it it's is. a totally different, but I, I, you know, sometimes I'll impress my bandmates. I'll play a ninth or a 13th and they don't know what the hell I'm doing. Right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> got to be careful with that. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So you've got a great, so uh, there's a lot of guys that took lessons from you that now play out. I know Matt Hopper did. Um, uh -huh. Who's the other guy in guitar relation? One of the guys in guitar relation was one of your students at one point. Brian correct? Baggett. That's right. When he was young, he took from me and probably one of the most famous guys. He, he's not a household name by any means, but one of the best guys in New York City is Steve Cardenas, who studied from me when he was in high school. Right. Uh, and, who, and so tell people about Steve, like who has he played with that people will be like, oh, yeah. Oh, everybody in New York that you could name, you know, uh, I, everybody. Uh, and he comes to town on occasion. Uh, and he was from, I think he lived in Lenexa or Shawnee or somewhere uh, when he was in high school. He took, but he, you know, everybody, um, Ben Allison and Chris Potter and it, it, anybody that you could name in New York, uh, he's played with them uh, and he's put out a lot of records. So, you know, I, it's, it's very satisfying for me to work with these people that have gone on to, to become a really good player. You mentioned Matt Hopper. He's playing just absolutely great. Yeah, nice uh, guy too. Brian Baggett too. His, uh, he plays great. He's He has a different background. He's more of a fusion kind of guy, but his uh, astounding technique that I didn't teach him that. I don't know about that stuff. Mostly when I teach, I try to give them vocabulary and a harmonic knowledge. Right. Because uh, a lot of these guitar players can play rings around me uh, technically, you know. They can just like, just burn, you know, like, which well, I used to kind of do that, but I, I don't do that anymore. I just, you well, know. that's sweet picking you do though, dude, that's, <laughs> that, that moves pretty quick. Yeah. That's pretty fakey stuff. <laughs> so what, uh, well, don't tell Ingve. Um, so, uh, let's talk. Why, why do you think Kansas city is such a great guitar town though? I mean, cause just off the top of my head, obviously that you and then Rod, two guys, you know, Pat Matheny grew up here. We just yeah. talked about Matt and Brian. And about, so is there something about it here? What, what Rob Witsit was another too. Uh, he was still active at playing around Rob Witsit. So you don't see him out that much these days. But yeah, I don't, it's always been that way. And I, I do not have the answer to that. Um, uh, before all of us, there was a great guitar player named Don Winsel who had a 
uh, I still have his LP down in the basement somewhere, uh, who is a great player in Kansas City, W-I-N-S-E-L-L, Don Winsell. Uh, and he, uh, Pat Metheny learned a lot from him uh, at, when Pat was a little kid. So I, I don't I I don't have the answer, but guitar uh, guitar players in Kansas City, it's always been a thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it's I'm, intimidating as a rock and roll guy to see yeah, jazz I'm guy. Not, <laughs> I, I feel honored and proud to be one of them. I'm kind of like an elder statesman now, you know. Um, but uh, you know, I I just saw the other day I was looking at something somebody reposted reposted on facebook and i was trying to save it i can't it's a photo uh there's a great drummer in town that passed away uh tommy ruskin mm -hmm. and uh i went to his funeral rod was there rod fleeman rob witsett was there and uh and we looked it, by the back wall stood pat Metheny. he flew in because he knew tommy very well so we got a picture. I asked for a picture. We got a picture, the four of us. So Pat Metheny, Rob Fleeman, Rob Wissett, and myself. It's a real nice picture somebody took and sent to me. Uh, I'd love to see it, man. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I was trying to somehow save it on my computer, but if for some reason it's, it's some kind of a format that it's not working out, but I'll figure it out. But <laughs> next time you come over, I'll show you. But it's a great picture to have. Absolutely. What yeah. a great, you know what the nicest thing is too? I was, I have not met Pat. I mean, and there's no reason that Pat would be listening to this, but Pat, if you happen to be listening to this podcast, I would love to have you on the podcast. Oh, he's a super nice guy and he's been very supportive of all of us. Yeah. That's what I was getting. You guys are all so nice, right? I mean, you don't, I, there's just, I, I, and I don't know if it's, uh, it's just this thing that people think that, you have to be the tortured artist and you have to be aloof and you have to be, you know what I'm saying? Like there's that, but you, you don't have to be that way. Like you and, and, you know, I've talked to Rod a few times at gigs and stuff. You could not be nicer and there's no reason why you can't be nice. So. Yeah. I mean, I think most of us are modest, you know, we're, we're, you know, we, we realized that, you know, we're like everybody else. We're trying to get better and, you know, we're not all hoity toity and, got all these attitudes you know I, i've met people like that and i you know i i try to avoid them you yeah because they just... just have this stuff going on uh and most of us are like you know i, I i'm glad that that is coming through to you that, but i see no need to have any kind of an attitude my gosh you know especially playing the music that we do uh it's you know it's challenging it's difficult and we're all trying the best we can and uh we're never done learning this music you know probably not any kind of music any musician you're constantly growing every day until you're you know absolutely you cac you know you just no, keep, i think that's keep, such an important part and i and i think part of the thing that's uh so when you start out playing any instrument right you have these levels and they're pretty quick right yeah right. plateaus and yeah sure and as the longer you play and the more like those plateaus last longer and longer <laughs> that's right yeah <laughs> before you have some kind of a breakthrough but i think like you said if you're any kind of musician that has uh a love of your art and your craft you want to continue to get better and then when you finally have a breakthrough where something just happens and you're like, wow, I finally figured that out. It's, it's very satisfying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's true with any kind of artist who I have neighbors here. In, uh, I live in Waldo. I've got some neighbors that are very good artists that, you know, do the Plaza Art Fair. They, they travel around to art shows all over. Uh, uh, there's a potter, there's a fabric artist and all these people are super, super nice. So I think, you know, uh, if you feel comfortable about being an artist in general, you're going to be a pretty nice person, you know? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So. Especially if you, I think that meanness or that aloofness might be an insecurity almost. I'm wondering if that's what it is because. It could, yeah, it, it could be, it, you know, and you never know. I mean, it could be upbringing that you have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I always hear these nightmare stories about Van Morrison. Like, apparently, the way that you irritate Van Morrison the most is to come up to Van Morrison and tell him how much one of his songs meant to him. And I was like, well, why would that be? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, you'd think you'd be like, oh, that's so nice that somebody cares about my music so much. Yeah, that they right. right. But who knows? So, 
Yeah. Um, I want to be cognizant of your time. I know you're very busy and stuff. So Danny, people listening to this, um, you have a website, correct? I can put all this in the show notes. Um, I, it, I it, do. I, yeah, my website is, it's dormant right now. Well, it's still on, but I, I used to put my calendar up. And then, of course, I haven't done that in about 10 months now. But yeah, it's it's dannyambry.com. And uh, my web host guy, you know, he's... I told him, well, I've got nothing to post right now. So, you know, <laughs> he's, sad, keeping, but yeah. he's keeping it open, you know, and I guess I'm, re, you know, retaining my domain, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, yeah, dannyambry.com is it. Uh, but nothing, uh, certainly nothing current is, is on there. Well, you know? but hopefully I, suppose so- I could post something myself, but I'm just not very technical. You probably know how to do that stuff. I don't. Oh my God, Danny, yeah. you know what? Uh, so, uh, I'm 52. So bands, it used to be right. All you would do is you take a flyer and you find a telephone pole and you staple it. You would staple it up, right? That was your promotion. Right, right, right. And I, 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 I miss that because now, you know, um, cause I'm the, you know, manager of Thunder Jacket, which all that means is I do all the work uh, on yeah. top of the musician part. So, you know, we have to have Facebook, we have to have Twitter, we have to have Instagram. We have, and it's almost like you become a slave to it. But yeah, that's sure. what the younger generation expects. They're not going to find you any other way. So, um, oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I miss playing, yeah. but I, I don't miss having to do all that at all. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. It's a daily thing, probably. Yeah, it's ridiculous. But you know, we got gigs that way. In fact, uh, one of the craziest gigs I've ever had in my life. We got hired by this uh, Filipino group. Has this huge national convention. They came to Kansas city. And the guy that uh, uh, was uh, putting it together was a huge fan of nineties music. And so we played at the Shriners uh, play. There was probably 300 Filipino guys. Yeah. And us like, and he was from Chicago and the only way he found us was through the internet. So, I mean, I understand why you have to do it, but it's just kind of a pain in the butt. So I hear you. Yeah. I, you know, I do a little of it, but I'm just at my age, it's, it, it doesn't just, roll off me easily you know so i I often uh, need to to get some help for some younger folks (laughs) well if you ever need you've got my number if you ever need help let me know yeah yeah so real quick before i go um you are the third member of sons of brazil that i've had on i've had stan on and i've had doug on um oh yeah both delightful um yeah so i'm real curious what and i've asked the, the other two the same thing what about Brazilian music intrigues jazz musicians so much? Uh, say that again. Ask the question again. Sure. What about Brazilian music? What about it? Does it? In, why does it intrigue jazz musicians so much? Oh why? well. Well, probably. Well, there's two two elements to it that have attracted me to it. Uh, one thing is the rhythmic groove, okay, which is definitely not swing. I mean, I'm a jazz guy, so I like swing, right? Which is a triplet-based thing. Right. Brazilian music is similar to rock and roll, where it's straight up and down, but it's a it's the 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 rhythms and the percussion sounds are very attractive. But the thing that's probably more important to me is the harmonic sense of it. They're way into to chords and chord movement, uh, and using a lot of upper extensions bitonality and all these very wild sounding chords now not every tune does that so you know they they have some simple things too but if you look at antonio carlos jobim he used very sophisticated chords uh and jazz musicians took to that way back starting with stan getz right uh because they could solo over all these rich sophisticated chord pads you know so they could find all kinds of cool notes to play. And that's what attracted me to it, uh, you know, for the most part. I, one of the first tunes I heard that when I was in high school, Mashkinata, uh, uh, Favela, Fool on the Hill, all that stuff, which was actually a, a cover. Beatles tune. song, right? But yeah, but they did that. So anyway, that's the stuff I heard, but they put cooler chords to it, you know. Uh, so to me, basically, like any kind of music, the harmonic thing and the rhythmic thing. Okay. Yeah, put those two together and, and it was great. It was different than Cuban music, which is a different feel, which I like as well. 
but it's it's not as harmonically complex as Brazilian music. You know, it's simpler, which is cool too. Uh, so anyway, that's that's my answer. Hopefully, that suffices. No, that's more than suffices. I, I tell people uh, when I have people come into town and they're like, "What should I go see?" And stuff. If you guys are playing, I always tell them to come out and see you guys because. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we haven't played. I bet I haven't done a Sons of Brazil gig. Well, I did one recently and i hadn't played this music in like two years and we've been together probably 27 28 years 28 yeah. years i think and you're all ridiculously good i mean that's part of it i mean i just think it's 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 good to see people who are all that good at their craft and um it's just it's a lot of fun and obviously uh both stan and doug could not have been nicer um and, and so gracious with their time and stuff and i you know i just oh really yeah enjoy. yeah i need to get roger on set next i guess roger and greg whitfield he's kind of hard to reach for this kind of thing uh but he's a super nice guy too he's our bass player uh and yeah roger would probably be thrilled to do it as well yeah he's all the people there i, I only work with nice people you <laughs> so, know isn't that the isn't that so true i mean it makes it <laughs> So I've had this group together for three and a half years and I've had a couple of people like, wow, you've kept all these people together. And I was like, well, I purposely pick people that I liked as people too. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Cause, Cause we've all had those bands and situations where there are people we didn't like, or they had yeah, a, yeah. an yeah. alcohol or drug problem, or they just were a pain in the ass or they were always late or, you know, it, and life is, oh, too yeah. sh- is life is too short. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I've done, I've done plenty of that stuff. Yeah. When, when COVID's over, Come over. I'll make you a cocktail. Will it ever be? My God. Oh, it's going to be over. And then we can, uh, I'll make a cocktail and we can okay. sit down there and you pick out which one of my dad's albums you want to play. Okay. Good. Sounds good. <laughs> so Danny, thanks so much. Um, oh, yeah, sure. I've learned so much from you and, and uh, continue to be very appreciative of what you helped me with. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. It was, I enjoyed it. Yeah. All right, let's. Here's to a better 2021. Let uh, next time I see, you, I hope it's in person and we're we're either one of us has got a guitar in our hands playing. Okay. Tell your wife again, her cookies are amazing. I will do so. That's why I can't lose weight, Danny. <laughs> All, right. All right, man. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, bye bye. Danny Embry, everybody. He's practicing two to three hours every day. Man, am I a slacker? I need to get on it. I mean, I'm practicing some, but I need to practice more, especially when you listen to Danny play. I mean, how good is he? Wow. Uh, that was great. So much fun. Uh, really appreciate it. And in the show notes, you'll see all the ways you can follow Danny. Uh, I'm also putting some YouTube clips up there. If I can find it, there's the Mike Douglas clip. When he played with Sergio Mendez, where you, if you look closely, you'll see Danny there. So that's cool, too. So thanks so much to Danny. That's going to do it for today's Trading 4. Hey, next time, I've got Damon Johnson, one of the uh, founders of the great 90s band Brother Kane. He also played with Alice Cooper uh, and uh, Thin Lizzy. He's also recorded with people like Stevie Nicks, Carlos Santana. Great player. Great singer. Cool dude. Uh, he's got a new album coming out. So that's why he's going to be on. We're going to talk all about that. So that will be up on February 7th. Look for that. Uh, until then, go out and support live music, either in person or virtually. And I'll talk to you real soon. Bye bye.
Oh, 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 oh,